Ah, this is the life, relaxing on a quay in our 17th picture at the ancient city of Noplia. Noplia has been a romantic port of call for more than 2,600 years. It was supposedly founded by Palamedes, the inventor of lighthouses. In the background, we see a 500-year-old fort on an island. At one time, this floating castle was a home for retired executioners, but it's a pleasant hotel for tourists now, no longer catering to such grim clientele. Behind the fort rise the mountains of the Peloponnesus. The oldest civilizations in Greece were born in this region, among them the great walled city of Mycenae, often mentioned in the writings of Homer. In number 18, we are standing before the Lion Gate of Mycenae. The buried city, which may be as much as 6,000 years old, was uncovered by the German archaeologist Schliemann, who followed clues in the Iliad and the Odyssey. He uncovered vast treasure, which could have belonged to Agamemnon, king of Mycenae and leader of the Greeks in their war against Troy. Agamemnon and his army may have marched through this very gate on their way to rescue Helen of Troy, who had the face that launched a thousand ships. Now in picture 19, let's go to the theater. Looks more like a football stadium, doesn't it? This open-air theater could seat far more than a modern Broadway playhouse, 14,000, and it was generally packed. Tragedy or comedy, the Greeks attended religiously. As a matter of fact, their theater grew out of religious ritual. The plays of the Golden Age, those of Aeschylus, Sophocles, Aristophanes, Euripides, are still performed today. The Greeks created in stone, in words, in ideas for the ages. Number 20 demonstrates a more down-to-earth kind of creativity. According to the Odyssey, while Ulysses roamed the world, his wife Penelope sat at home spinning. Here a peasant girl carries on the tradition. She lives in the 20th century, but she spins a thread of flax off a homemade distaff and winds it around a spindle as her ancestors did long before spinning wheels were invented. After a thread of flax or wool has been spun, it is woven into cloth for clothes, household linens, rugs, whatever is needed. Our next picture shows us one of the primitive household looms that the women use. As you can see, it's a family affair. Mother weaves while grandmother watches with a critical eye, ready to offer help or advice. In a mechanical age, these methods may seem crude and old-fashioned, but the people of Greece have always taken great pride in the beautiful things they make by hand. In number 22, we see a typical street scene in a little Greek village. A country woman rides to market on her donkey, which at another time might be seen hauling that brightly painted cart. This all-purpose beast of burden makes up in sure-footed endurance what it lacks in size. You will see donkeys all over Greece, hauling, carrying firewood, sheaves of grain, household goods, plodding through the muddy streets of villages past whitewashed stone houses. These people may live primitive lives, but they are lives filled with quiet beauty. Picture 23 shows us a simple fisherman's hut, gilded by the rising sun. The water, the sky, the distant mountain, here is a scene that reflects the tranquility and mystery of nature. No wonder the Greeks saw gods and goddesses in the sun, the moon, in every field and forest. Our next view takes us up into the distant mountains to a place of savage grandeur, sacred to the ancient god Apollo. Here the famous oracle of Delphi sat in a trance-like state in her cave beneath a temple. Her incoherent words were taken to be the veiled commands of Apollo. For over a thousand years, kings and generals and others who could afford the fee would consult the oracle much as some people today consult astrologers to find out how they should invest in the stock market. Since the babblings of the oracle could be interpreted in many different ways, nobody could ever accuse her of giving bad advice. And now if you will turn the slide card over to number 25, we will meet some modern Greek maidens, all dressed up in hand-embroidered costumes for a festival. The silken richness of these costumes reflects the influence of Byzantine church decorations. Everyday dress is plain and dark, but festivals are times for dancing and gay colors. The wool that goes into more practical costumes is shorn from the flocks that dot the highland pastures in the north and west of Greece. In picture 26, we see a sturdy shepherd. Here is a face that Homer himself might have described. The shepherd carries the traditional crook of olive wood with its wide wooden hook used for grabbing the leg of a straying sheep. 
he has brought his flock down to the market town of Tricola on the plain of Thessaly in central Greece. In picture 27 we see some of the rocky towers that rise up from the plain. That building, perched precariously on the tower in the center, is one of the famous Meteora, or monasteries in the air. They were built by 14th century monks as a retreat from the war-torn world below. The Meteora could be reached only by means of a net and rope, or a series of rickety ladders. But most people in Thessaly are farmers who prefer to keep their feet on the ground. In our next picture, we see the fruits of a hard-won corn harvest hanging from the rafters. Even in Thessaly, a grain center, the land is rocky and the soil thin. It takes hard work to scratch a living from the earth. In pagan days, food was cherished as a gift from the gods, and corn was the special crop of Demeter, goddess of the harvest. Thessaly is known as the breadbasket of Greece, and in number 29, we see one of the reasons why. How's this for a king-sized loaf? This little fellow's idea of a treat is a piece of delicious brown-crusted bread dipped in a bowl of clabber or curdled goat's milk. Judging from his build, he's consumed quite a lot of bread in his short life. In our next picture, we're out in the pasture where goats and sheep graze peacefully together on a carpet of wildflowers. Here is a scene which hasn't changed in thousands of years. The Greeks even had a shepherd god, Pan, he of the goat's legs and the sweet dancing pipes. Now in picture 31, we return to the waterfront. Maritime commerce is still the big business of Greece. We are in the port of Salonika, a thriving city of Macedonia, the northernmost province of Greece. A picturesque sailing ship unloads its cargo of barrels at a sun-washed dock. Macedonia was the home of Alexander the Great, who led his army victoriously through most of the known world, then wept because there were no more worlds to conquer. Alexander and his victories are long gone, but our final picture reminds us that Greece herself continues to conquer all who visit her. She holds our souls enchained with beauty. Her graceful monuments tell us that man was meant to create, not destroy. Her spirit is the spirit of democracy, of bright intelligence and hope, of freedom. This is the heritage that a tiny Mediterranean land has given us. This is the enduring glory of Greece.